God bless you, ma'am. Blessing, sir. Man, I just let in. God bless. Oh, Asian is coming up. God bless you, Lady Shan. Bless you too, and Sister Claudine. Amen. We are going to pray. Let's just bow our heads. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this privilege one more time to be a part of this study. We look to you, God, to direct us, Lord Jesus, direct our hearts, Lord Jesus, towards heaven, towards your will, towards your way. That your kingdom come, Lord God, in our presence, Jesus, tonight. We give you the glory and the honor that is due unto your name. Bless every hearer of this word, Lord Jesus. Save to the uttermost for your name's sake until in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we are continuing in our study as we look at uh, the topic of uh, fearfully made a part of the series on the doctrine of humanity and we are looking at um, uh, who we are as the image of God um, as individuals who are fearfully and wonderfully made our uh, scripture is taken from Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7 and we we read as follows. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils um, the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Uh, so two essential components um, that we are seeing here in Genesis. We are formed of the dust. Uh, on the ground, we are also living souls by an act of God. And what we are trying to do and seeking to do is to flesh out what does that really mean in real terms, you know, in practical terms, what does that really mean towards my identity when I ask myself the question, who am I? And uh, these are some of the questions that Throughout this series, we have and uh, you know have sought to give a response to, and are hoping that when all is said and done, we would have had um, a much better appreciation of who we are as complete human beings in, in the sight of God, and how does that you know how do, does our identity fit into the whole plan of God and our being saved. Um, so we ask questions like, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? What does that mean? Um, what am I made of? Um, you know, am I like the animals? Am I like the, you know, uh, birds, uh, my plants? Uh, what am I made of? Um, and what does it mean to be male or female? We will um, get to a response to that question. What does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman um, um, in the whole scheme of the image of God? And of course, traditionally, we remember in the Bible that most of the Bible... Oh, sorry. Let's see what this is. Can... Sir, sir, as you were speaking, there was something All right. interfering with the sound. Right, there is some, oh, I must apologize. There is some construction going on. And so you might be hearing that in that my background and it's going on there now. So I must apologize for that. Um, so we, we want to try to, and we will um, ultimately explore um, what does it mean to be male or female? What does it mean to be man? Um, man um, and woman, and as I was making the point that um, the, the majority of the, the, the text, the Bible, was written during a period 
uh, what we call a pat patristic period or a patriarchal period where um, male, where male, male gender was dominant and it kind of left an impression of an imbalance or disparity between the genders. So we want to really explore what Jesus had in mind and God had in mind when he created, um, when he created us male and female and uh, and paint a biblical picture or a heavenly picture or a divine picture of what maleness and femaleness ought to be um so we will get around to answering some of those questions ultimately um from the text god bless you uh lady michelle okay so by way of a brief review of the series um, that we've been doing so far. When we started, we were trying to, um, again, look at the doctrine of humanity. Um, what does the Bible say about who we are? Um, and we, at, at the very beginning, made a, uh, a, a declaration that we are made in the image of God. We are made primary identity of humanity. Who am I? The response to the question, who am I? I am a creature in the image of God. I am a reflection of who God is. Um, and uh, the question then comes about what does that really mean in, in, in real terms? And so we are, um, we will uh, try to flesh that out. We went, um, uh, at the very beginning, also trying to paint a, a more rounded picture of who we are uh, as individuals, but we will get to it a little bit more in more a little bit more detail as far as the image of God is concerned. And then we are moved on to so we are made in the image of God, but we are fallen. We are made in the image of God, but the reality is that today we are not reflecting the image of God as was originally designed, and men are fallen. Um, we are fallen. Um, all we like sheep have gone astray, the word of God declares. And so we are in a state of brokenness, a state of fallenness. Um, but we nonetheless, notwithstanding the fact that we are um, in a state of fallenness, that we do retain the image of God. So we are not, when somebody say that um, humanity is totally depraved, meaning that we are, uh, you know, uh, uh, absolutely cannot and incapable of doing anything good or anything to please God. Um, that is simply not the biblical model. And even unbelievers retain um, um, the, the image of God and have the capability to make a right choice or a wrong choice that can please God. Um, but ultimately, uh, because of falling and because of sin, those who are in sin ultimately cannot um, fulfill the eternal purpose of God outside of salvation. Uh, amen. So even unbelievers again, are able to are able to um you know to 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 to, to choose and to do um to do right and to do good and we are commanded you know that we should not kill thou shalt not kill because we are made in the image of god so that, that commandment was given after the fall of man and by that simple declaration that command we are made to understand the reason why we shouldn't kill each other is because we are made in the image of God. Even fallen men still retain the image of God and therefore we shouldn't kill each other. Um, and uh, in exploring what the image of God is, we would ask ourselves the question, we would ask ourselves the question, um, what, um, what, uh, you know, it does that look like? So, let's you know today that we are, we are in fact made not uh, to be body, 
in one, on one side and also we have a material side and we have an immaterial side. So last week we tried to make um, we try to make that distinction that we are made we have a material um, aspect to our nature. So if we ask the question, what is the nature? What is my nature? What, how, how am I made up? Um, or, or how am I comprised? Um, the, 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 the general answer is that we have a material nature and we have an immaterial nature. Um, the material nature, in most of the cases, the Bible uses the word body, but it also uses terms like flesh and bones, etc. And the immaterial side, the Bible uses several words. The Bible uses soul. The Bible uses spirit. The Bible uses heart. The Bible uses mind. And what we try to do is to, you know, to allow us to appreciate that we are uh, of a dual nature. We have a, essentially, we have a dual nature. Um, and the, the traditional understanding um, and most, uh, you know, apostolic um, 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 elders would, would probably try to make a distinction between body and soul, I mean, soul and spirit. And so the argument would probably be, that the understanding would probably be that we are a triune being. Um, but the, the the more sound biblical understanding, um, according to apostolic scholars, is, is that we are primarily a uh, 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 material and immaterial body and uh, body and spirit, or um, um, material and immaterial. And that spirit, however, is a complex, you know, far more complex than we would like to think. Um, and the Bible uses these terms, and there are possible distinctions, but we can't actually say um, that what those distinctions are and, and limited to body and soul um, in that way because of how it is used throughout the Bible. Sometimes the terms are used synonymously, interchangeably, and so we are, you know, we can describe the immaterial part of us as, um, as you know, heart, as a spirit, as soul, as heart, as mind, and so we want to to, to not limit um and the, the, what the work of God or what God has done, and also not to not simplify, try to oversimplify the complexity of God's creation in humanity, because as David said, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. God bless you, Sister Lisa, uh, um, um, Melissa, I see you there. Um, so we have gone through the, that uh, essential nature of, 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 um, human, um, of our humanity. And so what we are going to be doing this week, amen, is to try now to flesh out. So we said material and we said immaterial. Um, body um, and soul, spirit. What is the nature of that body and what place does that have in the scheme of God's uh, divine plan? What is our attitude towards our nature, our mortal nature, our human body? So we want to explain or explore that today. Um, we want to explore the material uh, side of our humanity. Amen. And we're taking this verse from Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5, which says, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Uh, this is talking about Jesus, of course, when, you know, um, the fullness of time must come, uh, um, come. You know, God is going to send his son and he's going to send his son not as an angel, not as a spirit being, but he's going to send him in a mortal, in a physical body, uh, which indicates that there is a divine role for body our material self in, you know, in God's scheme of things. And sometimes if we're not careful, 
we may you know be so focused on our spiritual dimension that we may miss the place that our 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 human or our material or bodily um, form or the, the physical aspect of our humanity of our humanity has in the place of our salvation. There is a role and a place there uh, for our body in God's eternal plan for our salvation. Um, and so we, you know, just looking at our world and, you know, where we are at in society and all over the world, um, you know, we see a lot of emphasis, you know, placed on, um, on, on health and well-being. And when we talk about health, a lot, great good dimension of it, you know, is about our physical well-being. Um, but we in church, do tend, of course, to negate and to really put um, our physicality on our body um, to a place where um, at points it becomes so bad that we are no longer able to actually effectively function spiritually. Um, and we, you know, we probably look at it far, you know, in a lot of ways as being sacrificial, uh, you know, as giving ourselves to God. Um, and, and, and of course, it speaks to the, the desire and the hunger for the living God. Um, but I would put it to you that if we don't have a, a complete picture of the image of God, we may actually do more harm than good in the attitude that we take towards our human, uh, our physical body, amen. So we want to try to appropriate that, uh, that, that body today in, um, from the text and of course apply it to our lives. So for this session, I'm just gonna briefly try to look at uh, body in the Old Testament through this word, this Hebrew word, basar. I want to look at body in the New Testament through two words, a, a Greek word called sarx and a Greek word called soma, uh, translated body, uh, translated flesh in one instance and body or corpse or organic material, organic unit, etc. in another context. Then we want to look at the human body as phenomenal we want to look at the human body as capable, and we want to look at the human body as eternal, as eternal or intended, at least intended to, and will ultimately end up being an eternal um, um, entity or aspect of our being. So let's start with this Hebrew word basar, um, which in, uh, some cases is translated soft tissue, soft tissue, as in Genesis chapter 2, verse 23, which says, And Adam saw, said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Um, so from the very beginning, we understand our, our, our humanity and our makeup uh, to be uh, this thing called flesh, um, which, you know, again, at Basara translated soft tissue. Um, so, so we also have Basar as soft tissue, um, meaning something that can be, can be eaten, it's physical. It, you know, it's something that can, you can put clothes over, you know, when uh, Adam and Eve sinned, you know, the, you know, uh, uh, they try to cover themselves as opposed to the immaterial part of us which can't be seen. So you therefore there's no need to cover anything because it is it is not visible at least to the material world. Um, but anything that is physical or material can be covered or can be hidden. Um, we are made of. Uh, the, the word basar again speaks to the soft, soft tissue, um, to our human organs of procreation. So the Bible specifically speaks to these physical organs and they have a role to play in our relationship with God ultimately. 
and of course how God deals with us. And when it comes to these particular, these particular soft tissue or organs, it also alludes to gender issue, male and female. How does that fit into God's thing, God's plan? We know that there is a plan for that because God made the body and it is revealing the differences in our human body. Amen. Um, so we talk about um, uh, the, the body also as being, the word baser as also referring to the whole body. So we talk about the body being something made up of soft tissue, but we also talk about the, the, the you know, body as being referring to the entire human, human body. Um, as in Job 19, 23, when he talks about in my flesh, I shall see God in my flesh, meaning in my body. So Job expects to, um, to actually see and come into the presence of God in his body. And so it, it shows that there is an eternal role or eternal place that our body has in the plan of God. And God has an expectation for how we treat with our body, how we, our attitude towards body um, and our flesh in this life. Amen. Um, so in, in some cases, and this now came into being because of sin. So originally when God created Adam and Eve, uh, he said it was good. It was very good. So there was no negative uh, connotation associated with body. There was no negative connotation associated with our sexuality. We were in fact pleasing in the sight of God. Our body was pleasing in the sight of God, sufficient that there was no need to cover it uh, because of shame. And this was excellent. Um, amen. But because of sin, the word flesh or the word body now became, came to be associated with weakness. So we see in 2 Chronicles 32 verse 8, with him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battle. So anything that is associated with an arm of flesh is an arm of weakness, an arm of lacking. And you know, there's uh, there are other references to you know having flesh for your for your you know for your defense. If you have flesh for your defense, you really uh, don't have much of a defense at all. And so flesh started to become uh, a negative thing. Body started to become a negative thing, and the, the, the implications of body um, from a biblical standpoint becoming a negative thing is that it also becomes or, or, or is seen as negative and portrayed as negative um, in our relationships with God. It is portrayed as negative. Sometimes we ourselves are ashamed of our own body, of our own this aspect of our humanity. And so we just constantly you know, uh, our constant impulse just to be, you know, focusing on our spirit, on the inner man, on that aspect. And what it tends to do is that it can cause an imbalance that may make us less effective in dealing with people who are all about their body. Amen. It may make us less effective in evangelizing and in witnessing to others because we are not appropriating God designed for our body into our message. And of course, in not doing so, people uh, find it almost like a very steep bridge, long or wide bridge to cross to get over into uh, a relationship with God. But there is a place even in the gospel for our bodies and God is not, uh, you know, intending that, okay, anything that is body or anything that is flesh is bad and negative and we should not associate with it. We shouldn't talk about sex in church. We shouldn't talk about uh, certain things, certain feelings and certain experiences. 
That is not the biblical model. The biblical model is, is effectively gives man a gift. When God gave man a body, it was a gift. And sin, it was that Mars, this, um, this gift that God has given to us. Amen. Um, so, so body again in, in the Old Testament. Um, so it refers to soft tissue, as we said. It also refers to the whole body, this word basar. But it also refers to the, both, both body and soul. So in some context, the word basar is used, not just speaking to the physical body, but it's speaking to our entire person or our entire self. As in Ecclesiastes 2, verse 3, I sought him, uh, I sought in my heart to give myself unto wine. Um, the, 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 uh, the, 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 the uh, Solomon um, here describing in himself, and the word myself here, no, it says myself, it's the same Hebrew word, basar, that is used and translated in most times to mean body. Uh, as in the material part of man. Job 34, verse 15 also says, all flesh shall perish together and man shall turn again unto those. Flesh here in this context is speaking to all human beings. Both, so this is re in reference to both body and soul. What that is indicating here is that there's a very close, intimate relationship between body and soul. You can't say that you are a person uh, without actually identifying that you are flesh and blood, flesh and bone. You can't say that you are a, a person without identifying that you are a living soul, that you have a heart and that you have an a, a, a immaterial or spiritual dimension. So, so when we talk about and self-identify, we <clears throat> equally have to identify with body as well as as well as soul amen so there is in the in the new testament now so that's the old testament depiction in the new testament it is basically very similar the concept of the material part of ourselves is very similar um, we talk about this word uh, greek word now sarx which Again, is translated soft tissue, or mean soft tissue um, that can be eaten, for example, in Luke 24. For a spirit has not flesh and bones, as you see me have, Jesus again, trying to let people recognize that this is him, the same Jesus who was with them. And how does he self-identify? He's self-identifying by letting them know that he, in fact, has a body, a material body, flesh, and bones. Um, if he was not flesh and bones there, um, he probably may be identifying as a ghost or, or, or a spirit, uh, you know, or, or an angel, um, but he's identifying himself in his body. And we likewise can't pretend that we are not living um, um, in a material world and we are material individuals. And that material nature or dimension, again, is not corrupted as it may be corrupted in, in that song, I'm a material girl and a material world. It is corrupted in that context because of the nature of sin and the, the, the impulse towards a sinful, carnal, uh, uh, car, sinful behavior, uh, but God had a design for this material individual. Amen. Um, soft tissue, as um, in, as from SARS again in the New Testament, kind of flesh, as in First Corinthians fifteen verse, First uh, uh, Corinthians fifteen verse thirty nine of men. Another, okay, so Paul is here describing the nature of flesh, and he's saying that there, that there are different types of flesh, different types of sorts, different types of bodies. There are bodies of men, uh, there are bodies of uh, flesh of beasts, there are uh, flesh or bodies of fishes, there are bodies of birds. So we, we fall into that kind of a 
nature where we have something in common with beasts and fishes and birds um, in that there is a physical um, um, corpse or material substance that we have similar to other creatures, except that there are slightly different natures within that physical corpse or body. But we are also um, body. And so when we talk about the image of God, um, this is, you know, we are made um, with a body and that body implies that there's some aspect of the image of God even in our physical or mortal bodies. Right, Sars again refers to the whole body, similar to Basar, refers to the whole body um, in Acts 2 verse 26. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, my flesh, that my, 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 my entire body shall rest in hope. All right, when, it, when I am dead and my, you know, I go to my grave, I have a hope, my body shall rise again um, and, be trans and be changed. Um, in John chapter 1, verse 14, the human being, the Sark refers to, the, to us as human beings, as a complete um, person again. Um, John 1 verse 14 says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So the word that or the logos or the thought that was in uh, the mind of God was made human. Um, um, and he was able to dwell among other humans. So Sars in very same way or very similar way is painting a picture of the material nature of our material, of our material nature, right? Um, there is also a slightly different use of the word Sars in the New Testament that is slightly different from how it may have been used in the Old Testament because here also body, where the translated body uh, also is um, used to refer to the nature, human nature in this life human nature in this life, for example, in Hebrews 5, verse 7, which says, who in the days of his flesh, in the days of his flesh, meaning that once we are alive, we are in the flesh, right? And so flesh is here speaking to our, our mortal life, the, the short days that we have to live in this form um, of and Hebrews 12, verse 9 also says, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us. Fathers of our flesh here means, of course, father um, after our human nature, right? So God is, um, you know, our, our father after our spirit, um, and he corrects us from our spiritual nature, but we've had fathers of our flesh. Um, who have corrected us as well. So the word um, body or flesh can also refer to our time here on earth, our nature here on earth. And again, it can't be separated from, from who we are. Amen. Okay, so what can we in general say about the human body? The human body is the material aspect of our human nature um, and it's a very specific um, entity distinct from our souls which in this life is joined to it and, and animated or given life by it so our immaterial part our soul or spirit gives life to our body gives life to our body and they can't be separate so if the the day that you separate uh, body from spirit, body has no more animation, body has no more life, body is dead, right? You are no more as far as this life is concerned if you are separated from your body. A couple of other things that can be said about um, the human or our humanity as flesh. Um, is that it is or, it's an organic unit composed of members. So our, our body is composed of 
of you know individual members and each of those members uh, as described in Corinthians and used to also model the church um, each of those members have different functions they do different things right it is integral um, to uh, our humanity and not as a mere appendage in other words your body is integral to who you are your body is integral to who you are and if you are seeking to represent God you represent God not just in your in your heart and some people go as far as to say well you know this don't matter it's really what is in your heart that matters that does not conform to the biblical model the biblical model does not separate our bodies or physical bodies from our immaterial part or immaterial dimension our soul and spirit and so whatever our soul and spirit represents in terms of glorifying god there is a dimension of that glorifying aspect in our body and i want to emphasize point three here again that uh, based on what we just read um you know all the various ways that the text represents the our humanity, who we are as the people God saved, that we definitely have a physical or material nature, and this material nature is integral to ourselves, to who we are, and it's not just an appendage that we're dying. We just, some of us are kind of just dying to just get rid of this robe of flesh and, and then, you know, just inherit our spirit beings, and then we're all complete. But this robe of flesh has a role and is a part of our journey that we have to incorporate, that we have to treat with it a certain way, that we have to have a certain attitude to, in order to get, um, you, know, the, you know, to the glory of God that he intended. Uh, number four, my, uh, simple statement, man is body. There's no, there's no two way about it. Man is body, man is material, right? Um, uh, point number five about our bodies, um, is to is that though we are body, but we are not only body. We are not only body. Amen. Um, verse part part six point six. Um, man's death is death of the body. So when we die, it is the body that in fact completely fails. And when the body fails, we die. Right? We die a physical death. Okay, so so what? Well, let, let's kind of identify some important characteristics of this material body that we're talking about as far as uh, God is concerned. We need to appreciate, even as saints of the Most High God, that our body is phenomenal. And I'm not using the word phenomenal in the, in the sense of, you know, wonderful, you know, this, you know, great and exceptional but in the sense that our body, we are able to, to experience our body through our senses. We are able to experience our body through our senses, and our body is able to experience others and things outside of itself through senses. So anything that you are able to, to, to see or touch or hear or smell or taste is said to be is described as being phenomenal. Uh, 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 phenomenal, that's correct. It is, um, it is in the real world. Um, it is not a part of your imagination. It's not a figment of your imagination. It is in the real world. You and I are real. We are in the real world. We can be experienced um, by our five senses. senses. Um, so that's, that's one. Our bodies are, uh, can be dis dismembered. Uh, we know that um, Eve was created by taking a rib from the, you know, the bone, uh, 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 from the body of Adam, and that, that was how she was made. And this um, is not due to our sinful nature. The fact that our bodies, we can take a part of our body, or dismember our bodies, is not in and of itself, a part of our sinful nature. Um, in other words, if you lose an arm, it doesn't make you um, less human. 
does make you less a person. You lose a feet, a, a foot, if you lose an eye, it does not make you any less of a person. And not and, and as some you know in the in the in the Bible would have misunderstood when somebody's blind, they say, Who did sin? You know, because you are, you know, you're blind or you're deaf, or you know, who did sin? Um, that is in fact not true. If you have some form of deformity or disability, um, that disability, well, not disability, but being dismembered is not in, you know due to our sin. But something that is due to our sin as it relates to our body is that our body is mortal or it is able to break down, it is able to die. All right. So all of us um, today as human beings have bodies that are mortal, meaning that they will ultimately dissolve, they will ultimately break down, they will ultimately die. Amen. And we need to bear in mind that this is the nature of our bodies and this is where it is going to end up. Um, so, so those are the characteristics of our, our human body. Um, something else that needs to be pointed out is that through our human bodies, we are capable. We have the ability to, to do we have the ability to, to do, right? We have the ability to experience uh, life. We have the ability to experience things through our body. Outside of our body, we do not have the capability to experience things, right? Um, so, so it is through our bodies that we are able um, to experience, you know, the, 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 the life that we're living. It is through our body that we're able to experience love. It is through our bodies that we're ex able to experience God's creation. It is through our bodies that we're able to experience uh, beauty. It is through our bodies that we're able to experience excellence. It is through our body that we're able to experience wonder, you know, wonderful things. So it is through our body that we are able to experience God. Without our bodies, we would not be able to experience God. So based by the nature of the characteristics that we just described, you know, the, the ability that we have to be able to see and hear and touch, when that mortal body is combined with our immaterial part, our soul, our spirit, we are able to experience things in a dimension that birds and cats and dogs cannot experience. When we talk about experiencing life and love and peace and even experiencing salvation and the Holy Spirit of God, it is through the body, our body that God has given us as a gift <clears throat> that we are able to experience that and so we need to have that place for our mortal bodies in mind. This body that was made in the image of God, but broken, amen. We need to treat this body as God intended for us to treat this body because it is through this body that we experience him. And outside of this body, when this body dies, there is no more salvation. There is no salvation in the grave. There is no more experience of, of, of the love of God, of the, of the holiness of God in the grave. So if you are not saved and you are treating the body as, you know, your, your, your gift and something to, to entertain and to play with. And we see some people, you know, doing all sorts of things, you know, uh, jumping out of planes and jump, jumping off cliffs for the sheer thrill and the sheer excitement of it because we are experiencing the natural world and it gives us a thrill. But let me allow you to appreciate that this body is not just for the frivolous entertainment and experience of pleasure. There is something far more significant that this body is to your humanity. Amen. And that you need to pay special attention to and to know that God made this body for you to experience him and his glory. 
your body is meant to experience more than the thrill of jumping off a plane, more than the thrill of going into a dance hall session and hearing the, you know, the, the, the music. It is, it is there for that, but it is there for much more than that. And so we need to maintain an attitude toward this body that is in the fear of God, that is in how God has designed this body to be. So this body is capable, amen, and allows us uh, and allows our souls uh, and allows our spirits to experience what God is doing in our lives, amen. All right, and the flip side of the coin is that our body is also able to experience uh, death because of sin. It's able to experience death. It's ex able to experience hatred and destruction and ugliness and failure. You know, and just you know, just want to just end this life. It is able to experience the sorrows of death, and that comes as part and parcel of the nature of our humanity, and that's what makes us human. If you are not, if you are not, if you are a human and you are not able to experience, and you're not going through uh, emotions of anger and, and stress and distress, um, you know, and depression and, and the feeling of failure and the feeling of the ugliness of this world, you are not human. You are not human. And you are would also mean that you are not a part of the ultimate plan of God. Because I want us to appreciate that a part of the ultimate plan of God is still to go through these experiences of our body, go through the experience of rejection. Uh, some people who are just not able to deal with rejection. If you hear some of the stories that so, uh, you know, came over the news about men who can't be told by the, the, the women that they are with that they are no longer in a relationship. When they hear that it's like something snaps and they kill the, 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 their spouse and kill themselves because they are not able um, to handle how this body experiences rejection. But the, the experience of rejection is still a part and parcel of God's ultimate glory and, 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 and God's ultimate plan for humanity. So we are challenged and invited by God to endure hardness as a good soldier. We are told, amen, that as he suffered, we are also going to suffer because as he rose, we are also going to rise. So a part of the human experience is going through uh, uh, these kinds of experiences through our body um, because there's an ultimate glory behind it. Amen. Um, through our body, we are able to experience strength. We know what it is to be strong because the Bible uses the imagery of, of you know, the, the you know, strong arm, you know, to, 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 to give us an idea of what strength is all about. And in, in knowing what strength is all about, amen, we can have an appreciation of the strength of God himself also, all right? Um, you know, in, it is through our body that we experience our talents. What is your gift? What is your calling? It is through your body that you experience that. And in experiencing your gift and your calling, uh, you are also experiencing a part of God. You are experiencing the favor of God. What is the, you know, the excellence of God is coming to you through, you know, your ability to exercise a certain uh, ability and capacity to do a certain capability outside of your body. You will not be able to exercise those capabilities and you will in turn not be able to appreciate and experience God in his fullness. Amen. So all of that is associated with your physical body, your mortal body, this body that we probably against uh, uh, may, may tend to disregard because it is not spirit or this body that we may tend to disregard because, you know, we treat it with such poor uh, poor, uh, such, 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 such scant 
uh, so as can for God. So it's belittling. Amen. But God designed our bodies and he designed it uh, to be a part of his kingdom and a part of his eternal plan. Um, you know, it is through our bodies that we are we experience mobility, we're able to walk or we're able to run. It is through our bodies that we're able to move. We're able to launch out. We are able to move forward. Um, and of course, through the experience of knowing what it is to go, um, you know, we have metaphors of, of life, you know, moving forward. Uh, and moving forward is a, is a metaphor for, you know, experiencing more and more of what God is pouring into our beings. And we are challenged to go. Don't, 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 you know, don't sit idle by, don't, you know, don't, don't, don't waste your, your, your time, don't waste your life. Go, go forward. Amen. Uh, into what God has for you, into what God has for me. And it is, it is through our physical, our feet, um, of our physical body that we understand the concept of going. Um, it is through our bodies that we understand the concept of, of reproduction. God has a plan, um, again, for our, uh, our ability to, to expand and to grow, to procreate, uh, you know, meaning to bear, you know, to have the fruit of our womb or, or the fruit of the, the, the womb of women. Um, you know, God has a plan for that, and it is also used as a metaphor for, for spiritual growth. Um, but it is through our bodies that we understand this capability as well. Um, the, the, you know, the capability, again, to bear, um, to reproduce um, of our own kind and to grow. It is through our bodies that we are able to experience and generate expressions, um, expressing uh, 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 our, 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 ourselves, expressing desires, expressing fears, expressing hopes. It is through our bodies that we, ex, ex, uh, we facilitate expression, and it is, through, it is through our bodies that we also understand the expressions of others, and by extension, it is through our bodies that we understand when God expresses himself um, um, into, uh, towards us. Amen. And it is finally through our bodies that we experience presence, that we experience the presence of God. And when we talk about presence, when you are physically there for somebody, it means something. And it, it counts as being very significant when you are bodily present. When you show up at a funeral and you show up at a wedding as opposed to when you are not there, it says something or it does not say something. And it also allows us to experience the presence of God. When God is present, it means something. And when God is not present, it means something. And so through our bodies that we understand these things. Amen. So what's God designed for our human body? It is an instrument to express himself. All right? It is an instrument to express himself. Um, he has a body through Jesus Christ. Right? So God uses a body to express himself. When we hear that, you know, you know, God, you know, uh, he sorrows, you know, um, or when we hear that, you know, the, the, the joy of the Lord, uh, or when we hear that God is glad or whatever, you know, it is through our bodies or his body that we understand these things because he has prepared himself a body uh, in the form of Jesus Christ. Amen. So if God has a body, amen. If God has a body and is using his body, amen, um, you know, for, you know, to reflect his glory and to reflect his image, then we must understand that there is in fact a place and a, and a role for our bodies as well in his plans, right? Our body should be seen as generally good, amen. And we should have a good attitude towards our body in whatever way or whatever form it is. Amen. Be glad that you're in the land of the living if you have a body. You may have not have a, you 
may only have one foot or one hand, as you know, it is not sinful to not have a foot or not have a hand, amen. But it is essential, amen, for you to have a body to participate in the eternal plan of God. So you should have a general good attitude towards your having a body and not allow the world to skew your perception of your body because I don't shape a certain way, then I should lose my self-esteem, you know, because I'm not, you know, as, as athletic as I could be, et cetera, et cetera, that I should have a negative attitude and want to hide myself. No, I am fearfully and wonderfully made as long as I have a body that my soul is able to exercise um, and do things through. It may not be able to do all the things that I described, but as long as that immaterial part of my body, uh, of my humanity has something to work with, you have everything. You have everything if you surrender to the plan of God for your body. Amen. Um, uh, if your body is in general is blessed, amen. Your body in general is blessed when God made you as a person, amen. He said it was very good, right? And he said, blessed is the fruit of your body, amen. So your body and our bodies are blessed and we are blessed to have a body, um, period, in this, in this life. We must acknowledge, however, that our body is defiled. It is now weak and it is vulnerable to temptation. It is vulnerable to temptation. So, so when we, when the, when the Lord invites us to keep our body in subjection, it's not out of hatred. It's not out of trying to punish. It is not out of trying to, um, you know, to treat this body in, in any way bad. But it is because we know that this body is blessed and it's going to be fixed up. It's going to be restored. It's going to be con converted from corruptible to incorruptible one day. So I'm going to keep it in subjection. I'm not going to go and allow it to go astray because of sin. I'm going to discipline myself. That's where the discipline, discipline is important in this life. Um, you have to discipline your body um, because this body, amen, has to take you through this life. This body has to get you into eternity, amen. And so we have to treat, this is one of the attitudes that we need to have towards our bodies. We need to have a, 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 a body that we are willing to keep in subjection um, and to discipline. And we know that our bodies will be restored on that day. It will be restored. Amen. And lastly, but not leastly, we should care for our body. Um, caring for our body, you know, as believers, it's, it, it is different in, in, in some ways, of course, from um, unbelievers. So then, you know, caring for their bodies, for example, it might solely revolve around being fit and you know putting on the best the, the, more, the latest fashion but caring for our bodies include um being healthy include uh eating right including you know uh, being in the, uh, the doctor to, to do checkups but it also means disciplining the body it also means keeping the body from overindulgence in things that are harmful to it Amen. And so we should care for our bodies. Amen. Because it is a gift of God that God has given us for his glory. And we are going to, if we are faithful to this body, we are going to see the fruit of our faithfulness to this body when this corruptible is uh, put on uh, in corruption. When Jesus came back on the earth, uh, you know, they, 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 they were able to touch him. He was flesh and bones. Um, but this body was able to walk through walls. His body was no longer now subject to sin and death and hell and the grave. And so this body is something that we need to care for and, and safely journey with. If the Lord says, listen, sometimes you know, need to restrain it through fasting. Yes. Um, that is an act of care for his body so that it does not become 
overly indulgent in the things of this world. Amen. You fast for a, for a time and then you go back to, 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 to your normal. You use your body, of course, to experience life. Amen. A uh, saint of, of, of God, of course, must and should strive to experience uh, the gift that God has given you. If you need to take a break, take leave from your, your, your employment, you need to do so. Uh, if you need to go somewhere and just experience the excellence of God in, in nature, you need to take a trip abroad, you must you know, do so um, you know, uh, to, to ensure that this body is being taken care of and not overly stressed. And then of course, come back again um, at times where you need to, 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 to not eat something that you should eat, whatever the case may be, amen. We should have a godly attitude toward this body because it is a part of the plan of God, amen. If you are not saved, amen. Of course, you are humans, you are living in a material world, but you also have an immaterial dimension and we will deal with that next. Amen. But this material dimension that you have, it is not the only aspect of your humanity. And God has a design for your, uh, your soul and your spirit as much as he does for your body. The best thing that you can do for your body is to give it back to the Lord. Is to give it back to God. He designed it. He knows how it works. And he knows what it needs. And right now, what he says um, and he's inviting you to do is to surrender this body uh, to him. Amen. Uh, you know, uh, 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 give your life to God today, uh, you know, through repentance, being baptized. Baptize his body in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. Your body is involved in that process, that physical process of baptism, even though you're dealing with us an immaterial issue of your soul and your soul salvation. You need your body uh, to go through this, this Christian initiation, this Christian rite in order to be saved. Amen. Let us bow our heads. Amen. And let us pray. Amen. And God allows us uh, to, uh, you know, to, to understand ourselves for who we are, body. Amen. Praise God. Material and immaterial in Jesus' name. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We love you, Lord God, for who you are. We thank you that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Mighty God, we thank you for a body. You prepare yourself a body, Lord God, and you gave us a body. You gave us a body, Lord, to experience you, to know you through our body, Lord Jesus, through the things that we've experienced and we continue to experience. We can't experience love outside of this body. We can't experience joy and peace outside of our body, Lord Jesus. And that's why you had to come into our body to redeem this body and this flesh. And so we pray for every soul, Lord Jesus, under the sounding of my voice, mighty God, that we may give over our bodies to you because you know, amen, its needs and how to care for it, amen, better than we ever can. And we pray, God, that you will save souls, body, amen, included, praise God, and bring us into eternal life for your name's sake and for your glory in the name of Jesus, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Um, uh, thank you for being online with us, and we look forward to our next session, uh, God's willing, next week, when we continue to look now at the uh, the immaterial um, nature of ourselves, and of course, uh, that the, the 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 role that we uh, that our spirit has, Amen, in our life and in our salvation. Praise God. God bless you. Uh, good to see you um, um, out tonight, folks. Lady Shan, Lady Smith, Lady Mel, uh, Lady Valerie. I see you. I'm still there. Um, God bless you all. Uh, Lady Michelle was here, but I'm not, I'm not seeing her. I'm not uh, seeing her again. She, um, she stepped out of the meeting, she says. So, so God bless you all. Amen. And we continue this series um, next week in Jesus' name.
Amen.